Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for the introduction, Nick. Um, I'm looking forward to telling you about model organism database about the plant that the previous speaker just talked about, Ravidopsis thaliana, as a place where knowledge, bioinformatics tools, and community come together. So I'll give you a bit of an introduction. So as you heard, I'm a biologist by training. I'm a bioinformatician by osmosis. Um, and over the years, I have really enjoyed learning the terminology, the jargon, and, you know, kind of the surface level knowledge of bioinformatics, and then communicating things like specifications and um, what do we want the page to do? What do we want the button to do between the biologist and, and the software developers? So, um, I'll then tell you about Terra, tell you about the community annotation project that Nick uh, mentioned earlier, and then tell you a little bit about another project that we have that goes beyond Ravidopsis. And I'm kind of thinking that you do see my screen, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, yeah, I can see your screen. Thank you. Okay, it's great. not changing, though. Okay, so let me see if it'll do it now. Yes? Yes. Okay, so when I was a bench researcher, I only knew the Terra database. I was like, and there was GenBank. And kind of over the years, I've come to appreciate that there's this wide range of online resources available for a bench scientist looking for information on the web. And one could group them very broadly into there's like data repositories. That's where you put the raw data. So think GenBank, sequences go here. Um, there are knowledge bases that interconnect data for broader context. So think a model organism database like Terra or a resource like Reactome. And then there are some computing platforms that allow people to analyze data much more rapidly than they could on their laptop or do analyses that are impossible to do on a laptop. So uh, an example of this is Cypress, which maybe you've used uh, if you've done phylogenetic analyses that require a high performance computing resource. Um, so they've got, you know, lots of resources that you can access through the platform. So I'll focus on model organism database. Most of you know this, it's focused on a single uh, organism, usually gene centric, collects information about structure and function, uh, will likely collect information about uh, publications related to these various genes. Maybe there's information on alleles, phenotypes, maybe there are connections to biological resources that one can order. So worm base, you can click through and order a worm strain or a yeast strain from the Saccharomyces genome database. And then there are many bioinformatics tools that are either integrated directly into the resource or that are then connected to from a mod. So there may be sequence analysis um, programs that you can access. There are almost certainly one or more genome browsers. You can explore that and travel along the chromosome and look what the various map sequence elements are. And then there's the attempt to connect to, of course, why are you a model organism? You're connecting to other plants that maybe are more interesting for other people doing research by providing lists of homologous sequences. So the one I'll talk about today is Terra. Um, and Cheta, perhaps you have used Terra once <laughs> or, or more, or perhaps this is um, you know, a resource that could be useful in your work. Uh, but others in the plant world, whether you've worked with Arabidopsis directly or not, will likely have used the resource once or more um, in their careers. And I found this lovely figure online of what the plant looks like. So you saw a little bit in, in Chetta's talk. Um, but I found this because it gave a really nice picture of, well, how big is this plant actually that you would rip out if it were growing in your garden, right? So it's really quite small. So the, the scale bars here, where you can't see them where I'm pointing, um, you know, five centimeters for the rosette, you know, they're kind of long and spindly. The flowers are tiny, you know, it's a couple of millimeters. The palm grains are even smaller. Um, and the beauty of Arabidopsis is like many other 
uh, common model organisms is that, you know, it's small, it's easy to grow in the lab, you can grow it in the greenhouse and in different conditions, it makes lots of seeds, so you can follow genetics easily, and its genome was sequenced completely first in the year 2000, which has allowed thousands of researchers and thousands of labs all over to the world to investigate what are the functions of all of the genes. And that's been an ongoing effort since the, um, even before the genome was first sequenced. So 25, 20, 30, many more years of work in this organism. Why do we care about the weed? Um, besides those reasons of model organism is because the knowledge gained in Arabidopsis can be transferred to other species like plants that are important to humans, either for food, for medicine, biofuel clothing, housing, all the reasons that, you know, plants are important for humans, but also uh, transferring knowledge from Arabidopsis to non-plant organisms. Why is that possible? We know that because genes in Arabidopsis share an evolutionary history with genes in other species. So what we learn in Arabidopsis, we can then transfer to the related genes, or at least get a clue about what the related genes and other species are doing. Okay, um, lots of people care about what's happening in Arabidopsis and lots of people use the resource. So in 2022, this 12 month period, you know, millions of sessions, people accessing, looking at lots of pages, many times a month. Global usage, so this is the top 10. Most of the usage of tares in China is about a third. Um, there's a huge agricultural research program there, many labs studying, publishing, uh, and making progress in this area of um, plant biology. Canada's in there too, 2%. And um, as Nick said, the project was funded by the NSF for 14 years. And then uh, since, so from 99 to 2013, it was supported by NSF, US NSF funding. And then since 2014, it has been supported by subscriptions from universities, individuals, and corporations all across the world. And that allows us to continue to not just maintain the resource, but to add new things to it. Uh, a little bit about the value that scientists working at Terra add, and that is pulling information out of the published literature and then organizing it in the website and the database so that it's easily accessible. And these are things like functional annotations, what the gene does, what groups of genes do, where they're expressed, um, writing up, uh, capturing the names of the genes and what they stand for, uh, writing a short summary and capturing information about individual mutant phenotypes, and doing that in a way that you can fill out a form to search and retrieve, hopefully, the information um, that you're looking for. We update every week, and we also uh, release data on a regular basis. So why might somebody have used Terror? Well, you might be working in Arabidopsis directly, and so you want information about a particular gene that you're not sure about. You may search by the gene symbol or the ID. You might be working in another organism, whether that's a plant or um, a non-organism. And so you may see, is there something related in Arabidopsis? And you may start searching with a sequence and then go from there. And then sometimes you may want, oh, I have a list of genes. I want to know what they, I want to know some information about them all together. Or I just want to know everything you've got everything Tara has collected in a certain area for the whole genome. And so I'll give you a little look into that now. If you're looking one gene at a time, you will not be able to read this, but believe me when I tell you, it's a long scrolling page with lots of information collected into it. You may be able to see the red, reddish, yellow, orange color here, and that is the bar, uh, eplant fever which uh, we connect to from Nick's lab. And so this is not something that Terra stores locally. It's something that we pull in directly. And if people click on the image, then they get sent um, to the bar for more information there. So it's both information that we 
collect internally and links that we provide out to other resources so that we try to make the hunting for information a little bit easier by bringing it together. And so we update this weekly. Right now, I'm showing you just the top of the page where you can see the standard name. You can see a symbol and a full name. In this case, a curator has written a short summary based on the literature. And there's a kind of a view of what the gene structure looks like. And if you were to look at one of these pages, you could then scroll down and see more different types of information about this particular gene. But what if you're interested in more than just one gene? Okay, there are various places where you can take your list of standard identifiers for Arabidopsis and just plop them in there and say, give me all the gene descriptions or give me this set of sequences or et cetera, et cetera. And in that case, you can return a tab delimited file. Maybe it's called separate. I think it's tab delimited and then you know upload it into Excel or your favorite spreadsheet program, you can then sort and you know slice and dice it however you like. And then if you're like, well, actually, no, I want all the information you've got that you've gathered, we produce on a quarterly basis data releases that you know have different files ranging from functional descriptions to the aliases, so all the symbols and what the, the symbols mean, uh, to annotations. To phenotype information. And again, one can download it and then manipulate the file further. We release uh, subscriber only files every quarter. And after a year, they go into the public release where anybody can reuse the data. Uh, we ask for CC BY, so for people to acknowledge where the data comes from, but otherwise, the use is free. A little bit about the tools that are available, and I'll only focus on a few. There are three genome browsers <laughs> because we can't seem to let go of the older ones <laughs> because people still keep using them. So right now we still support three genome browsers. Uh, and then we have several sequence analysis tools, whether that's BLAST or looking for a specific pattern or looking for, uh, so you can take a pattern that you're looking for, or you can, in a different tool, you can put in a set of sequences and see if there are any patterns within them. Uh, just a little bit about JBrowse. Many other model organism databases have an instance of JBrowse, same for Arabidopsis. Uh, we have, you know, over 250 total tracks. And what's nice is that we have a community contributing data. Uh, and 99 of the 250 are from the community, and they span from uh, various types of uh, expression analyses um, to uh, expression analyses, cage data, RNA-seq data, and um, peptide data. So different types of things that you can throw onto a genome browser and visualize in that context. Um, you may know that there's another version of JBrowse that's in the works, JBrowse 2. Uh, it's currently in beta at Terre. And aside from the tracks that one can see now, with JBrowse 1, that we'll bring over, uh, a nice feature for JBrowse 2 is that it will allow uh, an integrated Centenary view. So in this case, you can pick, I've shown that uh, species 1 is Arabidopsis thaliana, species 2 is Arabidopsis lorata, and then you can um, kind of visualize the two together. Um, that is not yet public, and we're hoping uh, the JBrowse 1 tracks will have by first quarter this year, and that we'll have the assembly sorry, the, the assemblies for the Centenary view by the Arabidopsis meeting in the summer. Okay, let's move to the community annotation project. So you may have appreciated that having uh, a really good view of what the actual genes are and what the structures are is an important thing to have for a reference genome. And over the years, um, these types of projects have been funded directly by grants. And this year, we're working on doing a community effort with Terra in a coordinating position. 
And so a little bit on the history. I told you about 2000, the genome was first sequenced. And kind of between 2000 and 2016, there were 11 uh, increasingly improved versions of the reference annotation. And this is Columbia Zero, same reference that um, Chedo was using earlier before he, he went into the various other ecotypes that could be explored. Um, so it's Columbia Zero. And, you know, as time marched on, there were different types of supporting data that could be used for improving the reference. So in the beginning, it was cDNAs and ESTs. Then there in came RNA-seq data. Uh, in came annotation of transposons um, and transposable elements at some point, and um, protein sequences and uh, peptide sequences as well to flesh it out. But you'll notice it's 2023, <laughs> and there hasn't been a new one yet. So it's it's been um, 20 years since the start, and a lot has changed, right? Not only in the amounts of supporting data, the types of supporting data, sequencing technology has gotten incredibly better, with much longer reads. The assembly software has improved, and the annotation pipelines have improved. So. It's really the time is ripe for doing another version. So in October of last year, um, Nick and I brought together a bunch of people from all over the world to talk about how could we do this as a community? And we kind of laid out the various steps that would be necessary to bring this project to completion, starting with using a new assembly. So all those 11 releases previously, basically used the same assembly, the one that was created in 2000 with like one update in, uh, for version eight. This new V12 will be using a completely new assembly, you know, and it's uh, the Coal CC, Columbia Community Consensus of Columbia Zero, and it incorporates sequence from 13 independent uh, sequence experiments of Columbia Zero from several groups. And uh, now as a PAG at Plant and Animal Genomes Conference in January, uh, Xiao Dong um, from Kerbinian Schneeberger's lab talked about this assembly and she called the quality insane. <laughs> that because of the very long reads and the multiplicity of reads, they were able to eliminate basically any error. <laughs> um, which means that we will have a very nice assembly of Col Zero to start the annotation process with. And then we'll do an automated annotation and NCBI will help us with that. They will do that annotation for us. Then we'll move into a manual review stage, which will be community-based. We'll host the tool at, uh, at TEAR. We'll get it into GenBank and then it can be disseminated to the many places like TEAR bar um, the NCGR genome, genome comparative viewer, other uh, Arabidopsis and plant resources that use this reference. So where are we now? The assembly was submitted to GenBank uh, right before Christmas. NCBI was able to process and approve it and release it um, near the end of January. And just yesterday, I got uh, confirmation that the pipeline is starting. So we sent out a call to the community for, are there any other RNA-seq or CAGE or ISO-seq sets that you think should be included? We got like three or four, and they're going to include them, which is great. And they're thinking they should be done about the end of March. And then we'll get to go in, into the longer phase of review and seeing what are the categories of genes that we need to check up on. Uh, ones that I can think of is like new genes. They'll have discovered some new ones, very likely. There'll be some old ones that are maybe going to be merged. There'll be some old ones that will likely get split. And instead of just sending that all out into the world without a human looking at it, that's what we'd like to do kind of as a community. And then, you know, the other steps will follow with the hopes that by PAG next year, we'll be able to talk about the, the, the new genome. 
Um, so in this case, Tara is playing this role of coordinator and, and community hub for making sure that this happens, not just for Arabidopsis researchers, but for um, everybody else as well. Um, I have a little more time to talk about phylogenes, and this is beyond Arabidopsis thalia. It was a project that was NSF funded from 2018 to 2020 and has been sustained by internal Phoenix funding since then. And what it brings together uh, is pre-computed gene family trees and multiple sequence alignments from the Panther database. This is a project at the University of Southern California. And it takes a subset um, from there, about 123 species there. So it takes, uh, it's actually 30 plant, no, 40 plant species and 10 non-plant models. Maybe it's the other way. It's 30 plants, 10 non-plant models, and then displays the phylogenetic trees together with gene function. And gene functions we're drawing on experimental gene ontology annotations. But we also add publications and link us out to Unipod. And how do you get there? You can either search the resource directly at the URL uh, that you can see on the screen or you can link from um, Tara Lucas pages, which I showed you earlier. So if you were to go to phylogenes, you could search um, by Uniprot ID, gene ID, gene symbol or keyword, you'd end up on the tree page. So it looks like two parts, the tree, and then the information about them. And this is the collapsed view. So you can see that there's 41 genes here. And if you clicked on it, it would pop out. Uh, so you can see that there's a link for this, this particular human gene. There are 41 publications that you can click out to at Uniprod, et cetera, and so on for the other columns where there are numbers. We have uh, experimentally based function information as well as phylogenetically inferred information. And if you click on the icon, it'll tell you more about uh, the reference. You look at the reference. So there's this nice tracing of evidence that's available right there. And as I said uh, a little bit earlier, we also uh, give access to the multiple sequence alignment if you're interested in looking at that kind of thing. And maybe you, if the difference in this particular position is relevant for your sequence alignment. Uh, one can highlight genes by organism or prune the tree um, if it's just too big. And you can download all kinds of things in different formats. But you might be thinking to yourself, what if I have a plant that's not one of these 40? What if I have a genome that's not one of these 40? Uh, it's still possible to try and learn something about your particular sequence by taking uh, the protein sequence. And then uh, they did, uh, the Panther team developed an algorithm that would graft it onto a tree if that's a tree exists. So as I don't know the the depths of the, the calculation it has something to do with searching the HMMs, finding the right HMM, and then connecting to the appropriate tree. So you can graph it into it. So that kind of takes me to the end of what I had prepared to talk about, because I was hoping there'd be some questions. Um, all kinds of social media and direct contact information we got on Mastodon too. Um, and I wanted to give you a chance to look at the people that make the project possible. We have some amazing scientists, some really cool software developers who will learn, who have learned to listen to us explain over and over <laughs> what it is we want the tools to do and us listening to them saying, yes, everything's possible. Just, you know, how much time have we got to do it? Um, so these are some great people. Um, over uh, a number of projects and every day is fun. We're an all virtual place. We are now mostly in the Bay Area, but we don't have an office anymore. So my colleagues are in Massachusetts and Oregon and Virginia and Florida. And um, somehow we make it work. So Zoom is not new. Slack is very much used. Um, and we get together in person every so often. And so while well, I wish we could be together in person and that I could chat with you guys over pizza, because I like pizza. <laughs> and also snow is something that's a novelty for me. Um, I'm very glad that we had this forum so that I had a chance to share um, 
what I have to talk about today. So thank you.